Welcome everyone to the Introverted Leader webinar. This event is being live captioned. To access the live captions, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. My name is Anna Voigt and I serve as the Associate Director of Student Life at Dakota County Technical College. I am also an introvert who has personally developed my own leadership skills by putting into practice what our presenter today, Dr. Jennifer Conweiler has written about in her books. I first read Jennifer's book, The Introverted Leader, four years ago, and for the first time I was exposed to the idea that some of the natural tendencies that I have as an introvert are actually assets in the workplace, not liabilities as they can often seem. I reread The Introvert, Introverted Leader recently in preparation for this event, and I was pleasantly surprised at how much I had grown from the first time I'd read it. The strategies Jennifer recommends really do work. They have helped me gain confidence in the skills that I bring to the workplace as an introvert. Thanks to Jennifer's work and observing introverted leaders in my own organization, I no longer feel the need to conform to extroverted behaviors. I hope all the introverts here today learn as much from Jennifer's work as I have. Thank you to the sponsors for our event, the offices of Academic Affairs, Equity and Inclusion, and Human Resources at Dakota County Technical College, and the Student Life Departments at Century College, Hennepin Technical College, Inverhills Community College, Minnesota State Community and Technical College, Normandale Community College, North Hennepin Community College, and Ridgewater Community College. Our campuses wanted to offer this presentation because we recognize the need for effective leaders in our organizations, the communities we serve, and the industries we support. Whether you are an introvert, extrovert, or ambivert, our hope is this webinar helps you better understand and bring out your own strengths and the strengths of those you work with. We'll begin the webinar with a presentation from Dr. Conweiler, followed by a fireside chat with introverted leader Michael Barrett, and ending with a question and answer session where we will answer questions from attendees. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to those who registered for the event. If you have questions for Jennifer or Michael during the webinar, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and post them there. Before we get started, we would like to get an idea of who is on the webinar with us today by starting with some poll questions. So one moment while I launch the first poll. So the first poll is, do you consider yourself an introvert, extrovert, or ambivert? Choose one. All right, so we have about 62% introverts on the call with us today. All right, so we will look at one moment, the next poll question. I believe that introverts are valued in my organization. All right, so we had about 34% uh, that agreed, 16% that strongly agreed. All right. So with that, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jennifer Conweiler, best-selling author and one of the top global leadership ex-speakers on introverts. Her pioneering books, The Introverted Leader, Quiet Influence, The Genius of Opposites, and her new book, creating introvert-friendly workplaces have been translated into 18 languages. Her book, The Introverted Leader, was named one of the top five business books by the Shanghai Daily. Dr. Conweiler has been a learning and development professional and leadership speaker at organizations such as Merck, Kimberly Clark, NASA, Bosch, and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. She also holds the Certified Speaking Professional designation awarded to a small percentage of women, uh, speakers, and she serves as a mentor to many professional women. A native New Yorker, Jennifer now calls Atlanta, Georgia home. Welcome, Jennifer. Anna, welcome to you and to everybody here making time on your in-service day to learn about introverts. And it really warmed my heart to hear Anna talk about her own journey 
with this topic. Uh, she is what we're, I'm hoping everybody at the end of our talk with uh, our fireside chat and my presentation will become and start to realize not just stepping into your own strengths, whether you're an introvert or extrovert or ambivert, but also to uh, become a champion because we are really in an exciting time right now. Let me tell you how I got into this work. I started, um, I was doing leadership development and training, uh, much like a lot of you are involved in in the education world. And I was teaching a class one day uh, for engineers, for about 30 engineers. And I noticed this young man named Sean, who was sitting in the back of the class. And I went up to him because he hadn't been very vocal in the class. And I said, Sean, how's it going for you? And he said, well, these last few days, Jennifer, it's been helpful. I'm learning some tips. I think I'll use them. But, you know, I'll never, never be a manager or a leader in my organization. And so I asked him, why do you why do you say that? And he said, well, everybody moves very fast who's in leadership and they talk very loud and there just isn't a place for somebody like me. And so, of course, I put on my coaching hat and, you know, tried to influence him by telling him about the great introverted leaders that we'll learn about, like Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and even Nelson Mandela, and the list goes on. But, you know, I could see him nodding, but he really wasn't uh, convinced. So after that time, that was a real turning point for me because it wasn't just that session, but so many other experiences that I had both professionally and also personally. I, as some of you who might be familiar with my work, I talk about my husband a lot, Bill, who's an introvert and we've been married 46 years now, which is hard to believe. But if I hadn't known about that lens of introversion and done more exploration after I learned about Sean and the whole personality difference, I think it would have been a challenge in my personal and my professional relationships. So at that point, the, uh, the seed was kind of uh, planted. And I went on to, um, to actually explore this more over the years. And the 12 years ago, my first book came out. What I want to do in, the, in our time together here in the first part of our program, we want to be very interactive. And thank you all for who've submitted questions to the team before. Um, and certainly put your comments in the chat. Um, that's really a great way to um, see where people are and how you're feeling, if you agree, disagree, what your experience has been. Um, but what we're going to do is just talk a little bit about what introversion is. There's some misconceptions about it. Um, also, some of the, uh, the strengths that introverts have, some of the, as I mentioned, some well-known introverts also the challenges that introverts have, that I'm preaching to the choir here for, I think at least 63% of you know this and live it, but I think we all need to know this and reinforce it in ourselves because we're working on teams, right? With other introverted folks. Um, and then we're also gonna take a look at um, the challenges as well as the, uh, a model that I have developed called the four P's that seems to resonate with folks, which is a great way to kind of organize your thinking about how can I not change who I am, not become an extrovert. We had a question about that. How do I not become an extrovert? Absolutely, you don't wanna do that. You wanna learn how to leverage your strengths. And so that's what the four P's is about. I'm sure Anna's quite familiar <laughs> since she read the, the last version of the book more recently than I did. So she will have her chime in as well. Okay, so let's start out. I'm gonna just show a couple of slides here and I think I'll um, share my screen right now. Let's do that. Um, so hopefully you guys can all see this. And uh, these, I mentioned these were the books and really have focused in on, in my work on not just leadership, but also influence, also how extroverts and introverts get along. And, and also how do we then not just try to change ourselves and adapt, but create systems and structures where it support, they support everybody under the umbrella of, um, of diversity. So let me pull, do the next one here. Um, so when we think about introversion, I like to, uh, I, I like to go with the old school definition and kind of expand on that a bit. Uh, Carl Jung, some of you might be familiar with the Swiss psychoanalyst because you've taken something maybe like the Myers-Briggs, who, which was really the foundation of that. And he came up with one of the early personality theories in, in the early 1900s. And what he said about introversion was that it's a basically about energy that you get from within. People that are introverted tend to be more in their heads. They tend to be deeper thinkers uh, or deep thinkers. Um, and that's where they really get energized. On the other side, we have here extroverts who are energized by being outside and stimuli and people. The caveat with that is introverts love people. It's just how much. So the deal breaker question for those of you, you had, I think we had 12% who said they were ambiverts or maybe more, 26%. 
um, of you who said that you were ambiverts. I think some people who think they're ambiverts, actually, when you learn about what introversion is, you go, you know what, I really think I'm parked over here. And it's not a matter of like obsessing over, am I or am I not? Um, we'll just take that poll down if we can. Yeah, I'm gonna do it. Um, so it's not saying, you know, it's about what behaviors are basically working for you or not. So we have now actually more brain research that says that introverts get overwhelmed and overstimulated um, with dopamine if they have, you know, like coming into a room and having the lights bright or the noise. And that's all brain chemistry that we're learning more about. Extroverts get need more of that to be stimulated and get their dopamine going. Um, we mentioned ambiverts. Now, most of us fall, whether we're introvert, extrovert, we fall somewhere in the middle. And think of it as a bell curve. We're not, um, you know, we know probably have friends or colleagues who we might term uh, it, a flaming extrovert. You know, I have a friend like that who I can think of immediately. Maybe you can, or a teammate who is always going and doing it, is not really comfortable with silence, not doesn't really want to sit still. And that's where they get juiced up. Introverts, very, we have people on the outlier side who, um, like uh, Maura Ahrens Melly, a colleague of mine who wrote a book called Hiding in the Bathroom, she literally calls herself a hermit and she's proud of it, very successful, but she said, I can only take so much. So I think it's just a matter of kind of understanding a little more about what it means and then you can move from there. Um, let me just say a word before I go into the definition. There is some people get confused shyness with introversion, and they really aren't the same. You can have a shy extrovert. Shyness, think about that as more um, like with social and psychological anxiety, where it can be very debilitating. Now, many introverts, I've, I've researched and interviewed many introverts for my, for my work, and many of them will say, and some of you, I wonder if you want to put that in the chat as well, that's children, you were labeled shy, or you felt like you had that label attached to you, and you learned how to overcome that. You took behaviors and took steps to become, you had to, right, to adapt to an extroverted world. But shyness can really affect us in terms of how we um, interact and, and how we, we work, but it can be dealt with. Introversion, nothing's wrong with that, right? It's how you're wired. And I think that's what Anna was talking about when she said that she felt kind of liberated in a word that's, that's my word, not hers, but um, you know, just feeling more relaxed and understanding this is who I am. I don't really have to cover. I'm not, I don't have to be ashamed of that. Um, so some of the strengths, I'm just going to put these up here. If I were to ask you, and you want to put that in the chat as we're doing this, what do you think the strengths are of introverts? You know, these are some like uh, some things that you can see here. I got my things covering all this. Um, these are just some characteristics and strengths, and you can see how they all can be strengths. When you're private and you're not sharing anything, you're also listening. Um, you're also um, exhibiting low key emotional expression. People feel comfortable because you're not reacting to everything. You come across, and that's huge now in this society we live in now where there's a lot of bragging, particularly in Western society, coming across as calm and humble and having humility and requiring quiet time for reflection. I wanna say just a word or two about that. That really, and all the work that I've done, I would say that's one of the absolutely critical pieces for an introvert. If they, if they have that time, and by the way, extroverts now in the pandemic are recognizing this, is so important, um, that requiring that time is really where they get juiced up, where they recharge, where they can then go out into the world again. Um, and it's all, we know that it's where our creative thoughts appear. It's whether it's going on a walk to get out of the house during your, your remote work or just sitting quietly and silently um, and meditating, whatever that is, you, we all need that time. And, but that is actually the huge strength that introverts have, a tremendous asset. Preparation, I, I know, you know, I'll use Anne as a case study. I knew that because she is identified as introvert, my guess was she was going to be very prepared with her team for this. I wasn't disappointed. Not that extroverts aren't, but we tend to do things the last minute, as Anna saw I did today. Prefers advanced preparation rather than being put on the spot. And that is absolutely, again, another ace in the hole, if you think about it. If you, before a meeting, have reviewed 
the, uh, the, what the purpose of the meeting is. If you have absolute questions in mind, like I interviewed one CEO who said, I come with my questions and I, I know exactly what I wanna find out and then I'm open. But that really makes him so, such a better contributor to the meeting rather than just saying, okay, looking it over a few minutes before. It just doesn't work. Uh, preparing written over verbal communication is another asset. And I found in my work on influence that in interviewing quiet influencers, this, they use this a lot to express themselves, get clear on where you stand. Tell me in the chat if that's true for you. Kind of just using your written words to clarify and to get clear. And then secondly, using that strength to then influence others and making a case. Now I will say there are some, yeah, absolutely true. We're getting a lot of positives there. Um, the, the written is absolutely something that if you are trying to influence and work with your team and you're constantly, like I had one manager, all she wanted to do to satisfy her own needs was meet all the time. Uh, Cause I think she needed that social extrovert rush but it exhausted the introverts and she didn't get the best out of them. And then an engaged listener, I meant that another, own it. I hope you're sitting up straighter in your chairs right now. Uh, prefer focused conversations with small groups or one-on-one -on -one interactions over large group, over large, um, what does that say, group events. And so now with virtual, that's something I'm gonna recommend that you do, that you not necessarily, you think more creatively about having large, instead of large meetings, you use the features of breakouts like you have here on Zoom, for instance, to or one-on-ones, one-on-one meetings. And a lot of companies are realizing they need to do that, again, to leverage those strengths. Comfortable with silence. Okay, I think you might have seen that I learned a little bit about I paused for a half a second, right, uh, right, Anna? So uh, comfortable with silence. And that, again, you'll see that that is a chance. It, it allows a chance for the ideas to settle, for you to settle, for everybody to settle, to pause. So that may be something you want to bring up with your groups, too. Even starting a meeting with a quiet, just reflection, some breathing. Let's just take a few breaths in. Let's get centered. Um, and that really gets everything off to a better start, for sure. Um, this is something that's interesting. As we talk now about who are famous introverted leaders, um, I, I think this is this is more. I mentioned Mara before. I forgot I had a quote from her. We're not all quiet. We're not all shy. We're not all wallflowers. Barack Obama is an introvert. Some of our most famous comedians, actors, public figures are extremely introvert, ec introverted, and a lot of people are surprised by that. Definitely. Um, who are they? Some of us are old enough to remember Fred Rogers. And those of you might've seen, there've been a few movies about him. I think Tom Hanks played him last year. Incredibly successful and influential to so many um, people, children and, um, and getting funding for the NEA. Ariana Huffington, um, I was fortunate enough to have some conversations with her and you know she is out there, Huffington Post, she has a company called Thrive Global, tremendously introverted. You know, and from all I mentioned, all aspects of life, um, we're seeing people, uh, you know, these are people I've met along the way or read about. And now people are starting to own, like your president at Dakota, <laughs> own introversion. You know, even Oprah, who believe who would know that? And she came out recently in an interview talking all about her introversion and how it how it has shaped her. So, um, and of course, we have to give some homage to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is a, a very well-known introvert and, and did use that term as well. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the challenges here that um, introverts do face. And, uh, you know, I, I just want to set the stage with that to think on a broader scale, if we are not uh, capturing the input, the talent of what we're saying is between 40 and 60% of our, uh, our workforce. And that will vary depending on function, it'll vary on uh, type of uh, organization or industry, but in general, between 40 and 60%, that's huge. That is like, there's no words for that about what we're, what we're having in lost uh, ideas, lost even revenue, right? Um, lots, of, lots of losses that occur when we don't hear from everybody. So um, under the umbrella now of diversity, uh, we live in a digital world, a diverse world. Um, those are really important. These are important things. They're not just nice to have to learn more about. So I'm going to pause the share right now. Stop share. Okay. Um, I don't think you're seeing that. Let me see that. Good. Okay. So uh, 
I've talked about the strengths. I've talked about some of the famous uh, introverts. And now I just want to share a few things about the challenges. Um, I, when I did live events, one of the, the, um, the tips that I was given was to, uh, to do a giveaway, a t-shirt. My speaker friend said, oh, Jennifer, you need to give do a giveaway and throw it, throw this out in the audience. So I got, I did a t-shirt and I had a, 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 I scoured the internet. This was a number of years ago. And you'll see here, I don't know if you guys, those, those of you who have um, video can see, you read my t-shirt. That's enough social interaction for one day. <laughs> and that was from introverts. And I actually ended up putting it on the back because several of them complained on my first batch of these. They were on the front and people would come up to them. And the laughter really comes from some pain. It's from people exhaustion is what it is. And that was really 90% um, in a study that I did of introverts when I was beginning this work said that they uh, suffered, absolutely suffered from people exhaustion. Uh, another challenge, and I wanna hear in the chat here, what do you think are some of the challenges? Um, I love that one of my heroes. Um, Yara, we won't put any political people in there anymore, okay? Um, one of, one of your heroes, I assume you might wanna put that in, um, uh, Jess, who, who your hero is. Um, and the, what we were talking about here is like lack of, um, uh, getting interrupted, lack of visibility. And so this has some real uh, negative consequences or potentially so if um, you're not being seen, if the louder people in the room are always being heard, a couple of people wrote questions in um, into the to the team here about, you know, the extroverts are in the certain area of the office that gets seen a lot or in meetings or they speak up first on the on the Zoom calls. And so it is a challenge, the pressure to self promote. And so you'll find an introverted leader. We have a whole process for how you do that without uh, bragging, like still saying what you've been up to, but doing it in a way that's comfortable for you, whether it be writing or maybe a one on one conversation, managing up with your leader. So you are really taking a little taking more charge of uh, she knowing about what you're doing, uh, particularly because your leader is going so fast too now. Um, and so those kinds of things are very important and introverts can be very successful, but can also be very, uh, can be left behind. So that's really important. Then the, another challenge, in addition to people exhaustion and, and getting, uh, you know, being interrupted with that, with that as well as lack of visibility is a negative impressions. And this can be very um, detrimental because it, it, it goes, it really speaks to bias uh, people, you know, we have this expectation in our in our society that you be friendly and warm and smiling. And many times, those tell me in there, you introverts uh, on the call, how what what people say about you when you're not smiling. One of the most challenging questions, or I or I get pushback on, is like, what's wrong? Nothing is wrong. And I advise my extroverted colleagues, do not ask that question. Nothing is wrong. So it is just how you're share, how you're in your heads. So it's not showing on your face. Now, interesting because extroverts, I mentioned before about the dopamine and all of that, they actually, their brains actually look different when you do a PET scan and the different parts light up and they get lit up when they see us, when they see another face responding. I call it, or it's been called facial gymnastics. Like, so even just, like I advise my, when I'm coaching introverts, they say, well, you know, I'm not connecting with her or whatever, or they think that I'm really mean and evil. It's not changing your whole affect all the time and just being like Miss Smiley all the time. But it's like, imagine that you have a camera, which a lot of you do now in the, in the corner of the room and it's watching you. And so you can actually use that when you, on your video calls to say, well, maybe I need to just smile a little. You know, I, I'm really into this stuff. Smile once in a while. But we ha I have countless examples of when introverts intentionally did that, not all the time, but just occasionally to kind of satisfy that brain of the extrovert they were dealing with, then uh, they did actually see more connection. They got results. It's the way it is. So I guess we need to all manage that in ourselves, not change, but adapt, right? And uh, the extroverts, on the other hand, of course, we can do a whole, we do a whole nother course on that, on how they need to listen and how they need to be quiet. How am, I, how am I doing on time, Anna? I was trying to watch. We got a little more. Uh, if you have a couple more points to make, feel free. Otherwise, we can uh, jump to the fireside chat. Right? Okay, because I know we want to get to the fireside chat. So I think I will um, I, I will just summarize by just giving the, the since I mentioned the four Ps, I just want to give a quick, a quick overview of that. And folks, you can find more about that on my website. I have downloadable free excerpts from the book. 
uh, jenniferconwaller.com. And if you like it, you can buy the book. My, my publisher would be happy about that. But certainly feel free to, um, to download a few chapters. And really what the four P's is, and again, let me show real quick and then we can end on, um, end on that. It's, it's just an easy way to remember um, how to you know, develop your own strengths. And it, the, the thing that, and I took this all from the words of introverts in, in my interviews with them. They carefully prepare, like we talked about, devise a game plan for anything that they're going into. I mentioned the meetings, interviews, uh, today's session, whatever it is. And that really helps you be successful. And that is when you're working on skills and strengths that maybe you're not so good at, like networking or public speaking. You still want to apply this. And I'm sure Anna can tell you offline if you connect with her, how she's applied that specifically in her role as a college administrator. And uh, Anna, you can might even want to put something in the chat on that or let people know how they can contact you. And then presence is being in the moment. It's not... Uh, it's not looking at the past and what you didn't prepare or you didn't you know, cross this T or dot this I. It's saying, okay, I've done the best I can in preparing. Now I'm gonna be in the moment. And so when things come up, I can react. I'm not gonna be you know, looking at my notes all the time. I'm gonna be with that person. The best introverted leaders I mentioned listening are totally where their feet are with that person. They are not, even if it's um, you're, as, as uh, Dr. Burnt and Michael says, when you are with that person, you are giving them such a gift. And uh, I think I want to talk more about that with you, uh, Michael, if we can. And then pushing is stepping out of your comfort zone. What can you do to stretch? So not, it's not so much that it's going to be excruciating. You're going to feel muscle pain the next day, but that you actually are learning and growing. And um, the introverts, the introverted leaders do that consistently. They uh, constantly are challenging themselves just enough so they keep getting better at what they're doing. And then finally, practice, you know, the great virtuosos. Uh, like Joshua Bell, the violinist never stops practicing. So you constantly want to refine your skills and that gives you a much more balanced skill set so that you can pull from your extroverted side, pull from your introverted side when you need to and be intentional about it. So I think what we covered just in summary was, you know, what introversion is, hopefully you got a better idea of that and some of the strengths and the challenges and what are a couple of strategies that introverted leaders use to be successful. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back to my, uh, my host, our host, uh, Anna. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we would now like to welcome Michael Barrett to the discussion. Michael serves as president of Dakota County Technical College and Inver Hills Community College. Michael is an introvert who has held a variety of leadership positions and Michael's career journey is a testament to the ability of introverts to reach the highest levels of leadership. Welcome, Michael. Michael, you, can, you tell us, can you tell us a little bit about your uh, interest in being a part of this conversation today about introverted leaders? Absolutely. I was thinking back, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I had planned to be an architect until I realized that architects spend most of their time talking with clients and not tucked away drafting. And then when I was a graduate student, I had studied to be a literature scholar, right? Because I thought I could be tucked away in a college library. And, and as I imagined my career, I was playing to my natural tendencies. But I learned in teaching that, that really people were far more interesting than novels. And as I progressed through different leadership positions, I, I learned I had to get comfortable uh, being with people all the time. And so as I was, as I was reading Jennifer's book, uh, I saw many good strategies some of which I had stumbled upon in my own career as I tried to find ways to be authentic uh, in roles that usually expected me to be more extroverted. And so I'm excited about today's conversation with you, Jennifer. Uh, I'd love to pick up more insights on how I can lead from uh, lead more effectively uh, as an introvert. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm happy to be here, Michael. You already are doing it well. So uh, it's just, uh, would you agree? Let me, this question wasn't on the list, but would you, would you say that you do something like the four P's that you actually are intentional about some of the people and the interpersonal skills? And maybe you could give us a quick example um, of how that plays out for you as a, as a senior leader. Sure. Well, I think the, the, the one P on preparation and the other on practice, I do that a lot. Um, oftentimes I have to script out my day to, to be comfortable going into it. 
uh, and as my days get longer, then I have to push into the margins of the early morning or, or the late night. But if I, I find if I don't do that kind of preparation, uh, it's a lot harder for me to be effective or at least to feel that I'm effective as I go through the day. Mm. So people in, on your team see that. Do you also encourage them to do the same? You know, that's that's something that I was reflecting on as you were talking, that there's there's uh, good opportunities in in what you're sharing to bring mm -hmm. that back to my own leadership teams uh, to encourage that kind of, of um, and how do we become more inclusive in, in the different approaches we take to working together? Yes, yes. And you're a great example of somebody who's been doing the work. And now I think we're at the next stage now, right? Where, um, okay, well, how do we affect a culture? You know, like Edgar Schein, the organizational psychologist talks about, it's not what leaders say, it's what they do that, uh, you know, that may really change the whole culture of the organization. So I think people are observing that in you. And I think for a lot of us as team members or leaders, we can encourage others to sure. even just learn about this topic, right? Yeah. Well, I, I liked your earlier point that that there that being an effective introverted leader is, is, is about adopting uh, adaptive practices as an individual, but it's also about working on the systems and the Mm -hmm. well, the systems and structures. Structures, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that that too. It, how you set up the ways in which you do work together can can empower introverted leaders to be fuller fuller partners in the work. Right, and so thank you for that. I think what what it's just important. Once we, I think one of the questions you had, Anna, was about what leaders can do. I think the three. I can't see you. I just see your picture. <laughs> I'll talk to your picture. That's fine. Um, there you are. Stay with us, Anna. Stay with us. Okay. So you asked about what three steps that leaders can take to get the best out of introverts. I thought that was a very provocative question. And I think to Michael's point too, I think to get to know introverts, to understand that it's to make it safe for them to be themselves. And I, I think that goes with all aspects of diversity now. So I'm very pleased to have this topic be kind of in the circle now of the discussion of diversity, because we're for there's a term that's used in diversity and inclusion and equity about um, covering. And that always sticks with me, the idea that so many, we, we cover parts of ourselves. And uh, so the person who did really good work on this, if you're interested in learning more, is Jennifer Brown, who wrote a book called The Inclusive Leader. Um, which is excellent. And it um, also has a model, but it really, she talks about this covering and that that has really stuck with me because how that's really what introverts say that they do, they have done if they're not feeling comfortable, like the young man I, I mentioned in the beginning of my talk. So that, that was one thing. And then I'll just say one other. Um, it's just um, about really being intentional about practices. Like it doesn't mean you have to have a grand strategy plan, you know, strategic plan. But if you're thinking about your hiring, for instance, um, what does that look like? When you go through the day, I sat with a group of leaders. It was very eye-opening a few years ago. It's uh, last year when I was research. I don't know what year this is, but anyway, it was last year at Silicon Valley because I went out there to kind of discover what some of the best practices were. And we were, I was eating lunch with these managers, mid-level managers, and they talked about the exhaustion of the hiring process. You know, they, they had a whole setup. They were very organized and structured like engineers are, but they uh, said by the end of the day, when they bring people in to do that final presentation, they don't get the best out of them. They think they can do much better. It's kind of disappointing actually. And so one of the things they tried was like, oh, they, they came up with it at lunch. They said, let's, um, let's just have them stay overnight. And I think we can afford that to get. And the next morning they came in and they did the presentation. And that was because they were introverted, a lot of them, sure. you know? So it's just... And then think about it. If they get somebody that they might have passed over because that person didn't seem like they really were on top of it, you know, they were losing a lot. And I heard many examples of that about, about where um, the hiring process was shut down prematurely. Um, people said, you know, they got feedback. Well, he's not really the kind of guy I want to have a beer with. This was in different industries, you know. And so we have to be really careful that in all of, I have seven practices in the new book that you know, everything from learning and development to how you communicate, where you just want to think, okay, where are the introverts parked on this? Just like when I think about millennials or Generation Z, I think, oh, okay, I'm not going to just keep calling them on the phone and leaving voicemails. Because <laughs> I learned from my daughter, they never listen. It's like, didn't you listen to my long voicemail? No. Okay. So we learn how to communicate with each other, right? 
you, did you have anything else on that, Michael, as far as what leaders can do? We had. No, I, I mean, I think the taking time to to talk intentionally with your colleagues about what what are the conditions under which they work best. Yeah. And then pulling that together into some of the the protocols you use and in, in how you make decisions together, how you communicate. I think being being a uh, self aware that way can make your team more effective. Mm -hmm. And okay. sometimes you over time. You you figure those things out right as you as you you storm and norm with one another, and and so having this as a dimension you think about I think is very useful. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and and ask people you know like another practice that um, I'll, I'll give as an example of that is brain writing that Anna probably knows about. I don't know if you've tried that Anna in your in your team meetings. Have you tried it on yet? Not yet on the list. Okay. Brain writing has been around for a while, but people don't really use it. They think we need to just stand up there at the chart or now we're doing it on the whiteboard um, and, uh, you know, get the first ideas that come, but that's really not as effective. Research has shown that if you give people just even a few minutes to write down their answers to a question that you're trying to address in a meeting, and then you get, you give that advantage to everybody, every personality type, because they're going to give you better output. And so brain writing just, you know, thinking about your methods throughout a meeting or in an interaction is just, those are some other strategies you can use. Sure. And we have about uh, 25 minutes or so left in the webinar and we received mm -hmm. quite a few questions from the audience. If it's all right with uh, you two, uh, could we jump in? Sure. Some questions? All right. So thanks to everyone that submitted uh, questions in advance. We received some really good questions. Um, some uh, Michael and Jennifer have already touched on. Uh, if you have additional questions, uh, click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and post them there. We may not be able to get to all of the questions in the remainder of the hour, but Jennifer has graciously offered to answer some additional questions at a later time. We will email those responses out to those who registered. We have grouped some of the questions are kind of in the same topic areas together for Jennifer and Michael to speak to a little more broadly. So with that, let's jump into our first question from the audience. This was a really interesting one. Um, how can an introvert become an extrovert? And I discovered that I am an introvert later in life. How does one recover from trying to live the life of an extrovert? Yeah, I don't, you know, that's real. I'll let, Michael, do you want to? I mean, I can start with it, but um, yeah, please. It, I mean, I think what we know, it's ex well, there are two different questions there, but I think just in summary, it's very exhausting to be playing a role all the time, you know, very exhausting. And so, and it, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's not bringing out who you really are. Is that really what you want to share? So um, I don't think you want to become an inch. I think I have a problem with the question. You don't, want to, you don't want to become an extrovert, but you can adapt the extroverted parts of yourselves and use them, you know, selectively. Um, so maybe, for instance, as an, a quick example, you, I hear from a lot of introverts, they don't like small talk in, um, in, in social situations, right? So what they do is they, uh, instead of like standing there and like the conversation kind of dies and they're at a meeting to try to mingle, they uh, prepare some questions. They use that strength of preparation. They even might practice it. I had one guy who actually researched the people who were gonna be at the meeting. I've heard that several times actually, and found some talking points to go in with so that raised his confidence and his comfort level. So again, he didn't become an extrovert, but he used uh, what extroverts would do, which would be to sort of share, share his um, uh, part of the conversation because extroverts will tell you it's very difficult they get very tired trying to pull out introverts and they kind of like don't find it satisfying they want to learn about other people so that's just one example um how about what do you think michael on that one how does one recover is that the question from be trying to live a life of an extrovert what do you think michael on that one yeah i don't you know the i think for me the the Sometimes the anxiety associated with being thrust into situations where you're you're asked to to um, almost want to say perform in ways that aren't comfortable. One of the ways that I've been able to to adapt to it is to is to practice mindfulness, and and that allows me then to to recognize the anxiety I might be feeling, but but not be not uh, dwell in it or not be paralyzed by it. And so that's. And more and more, as I get into higher levels of leadership, I have the opportunity to to develop the structures that allow, you know, the the a variety of different uh, uh, types of interact you know, people where, where how they're comfortable and how they get how they get uh, juiced to to be able to interact effectively. So it allows me allows me to kind of set the structures within which I can be even effective too. 
So self-care and mindfulness, can you, a lot of people say it's about meditation, it's about being present, like that second P. Um, <clears throat> what would it look like for people here to be more mindful, like who are introverted and get anxious? Because you do, I do hear a lot about anxiety around having to be a certain way. And it's very, we live in an extroverted world, let's be honest still. Mm. So what do you, what do you think about um, what people could do? Is it the breathing? Yeah, I mean, for me, it's really just acknowledging, it's that going through that mental exercise of acknowledging what I'm feeling without, and being able to, to pull back from that, you know, to, to feel it without being immersed in it. Um, I think to your other point too, about opportunities for self-care, um, for me, it's just being able to do things that don't require me to be present. And so it's walks in nature, it's running, it's video games, uh, anything like that, that, that allows me to, to, to be by myself and, and to be in, within myself without having to be um, performing. Yeah, that's really great. And I think one of the challenges we have now with, I know a lot of you are working at home is uh, people are working more. Mm -hmm. They're working more hours and they're not, I don't think they're building in that time. Um, and folks are not taking vacations either, right. I'm, I'm reading. So I think that your point about scheduling and being very mindful about um, you taking breaks and building in the breaks throughout the day. There's a lot of great apps like um, Calm and Insight Timer, and you can just go on there and, and really just build it into your day and not just do it as a one time a week kind of thing. Journaling, you know, and it's great to hear you as a senior leader say that because it used to be kind of more like a woo woo thing, but we know it's absolutely essential to you know, lowering blood pressure to reducing anxiety, all of these things. So it's great to have you as a case study there. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so uh, next question, uh, this one is for Michael. Michael, what is the most common challenge that you have faced as an introvert and a couple strategies that you've used to overcome the challenge? And it sounds like we talked a little bit about a couple things, but is there anything you'd add to that? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I think I think the, the challenges that I, you know, Jennifer, you talk in your, your book about people exhaustion, the fast pace of work, getting interrupted all the time, feeling pressure to promote myself to be recognized as, as leading. Those are all things that I experience. Uh, and I think the strategies, as I, as I mentioned, taking time to script out the day, uh, or just to, to hear the things I wanna make sure I cover with each of, the, each of my colleagues that I'm meeting with or the meeting that we're hosting. Um, Taking time to, to think that through takes a lot of the anxiety out of the day because I have a sense of what where I, what I'm trying to accomplish, and I think that that level of intentionality is a is a great strength that introverts can bring. Um, and so I, that's and then taking time for that self care, I, I think that is um, critical. All right, thank you, Michael. Uh, this next question I think will be relevant to a lot of people on the call says, as an introverted teacher, I need a break between groups when teaching to recharge. Any tips for teachers like me? And how can introverts help others understand our need for that quiet time to recharge? I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, I taught for, for many years and one of the ways I was able to, if you can build in times for students to facilitate learning among themselves, you know, small groups, uh, project-based learning, things where, where you're not trying to facilitate all of the learning and being actively engaged in it gives you that, that opportunity to pull back and, and to do what introverts can do really well, which is to just listen and to process. And it also gives, I know it, it gives me an opportunity to recharge as we go into maybe the second half of a class. Uh, and, and Jennifer, you mentioned that too, that Zoom has the capability to do breakout rooms and some of those things that, that there too, you can, you can do that in an online learning environment. Um, the other thing I, I'll do too is as you look for breaks in between classes or you know, between meetings is to take a more, a, a more circuitous route back or to even put, take some time to not go back to your office because you know that there'll be people waiting for you there. There's messages to respond to. And, and so building in even just four or five more minutes uh, can make a big difference for and help with recharging. Uh, one other thing I used to do when I was teaching is, is and this is maybe a little counterintuitive, but um, I would try to find a student to leave class with. So we'd have a, an opportunity to walk and talk. And even though I was with somebody, it was a different kind of relationship and I wasn't, and, and so I found it a, a great way to connect with students, but it also allowed me um, to be in a, in a conversation that was recharging rather than draining. 
All right, thanks, Michael. Yeah, can I, I mentioned there's a good question here from a um, person whose name I love, Jennifer <laughs> Gall, who said, Jennifer said, I find when I go to an interview and if I'm, um, oh no, this was, I wanna ask, answer that question. There was another one that came in. Do you schedule that preparation time from Jean into your daily schedule, Michael? And that preparation is what I find consuming my time outside of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I think, you know, that's tough. When, if you don't have control over your schedule, it's tough to build that time in. And, and so, um, yeah. you know, if I, can, if I can start, I mean, the, the reality is in my current position, most meetings with the business community start at anywhere from 6.30 to 7, 8, because that's when people are available before they go off to their, to their own places of employment. And that makes it very tough then to do the kind of preparation. Um, and then so the reality is I, I um, get up usually at four and then and do that kind of prep work, but that's, you know, it, it, it pays off again in the, in the psychological comfort mm -hmm. I can bring into the day. Mm -hmm. You're, you're with a lot of, uh, a lot of people, famous people who are introverted, who get up early. So that seems to be a common theme. As Stephen King said, you know, the mornings are for getting up early writing and the afternoons are for baseball. <laughs> so he rewarded himself. Right. So, um, and if it's okay, I'm just going to scoop back to Jennifer's question. I find when I go into an interview and if I'm not presented with the questions prior to my, prior to my brain goes into lockdown mode. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, or it, it's a very provocative question as well. Um, I think you, the more preparation you can do in interviewing, I used to be a career coach. So I say this, you can oftentimes sort of take more control of the interview by like shifting by having examples and, um, and, and strong content and knowing what points you want to get across. I'm not saying you're going to not answer the question, but you can um, not be as, as receptive, right? To like, just at the whims of most interviewers aren't that good anyway. So you can sort of make sure that you're doing what we call a little bragging on yourself and sharing, but also paraphrasing. That's another key tip I want to share with introverts here, because when you do freeze, um, and Anna's nodding there, like it's a great stalling technique. You know how we learn to say back in each other's, in what we're hearing you say, and it's an active listening strategy. Well, you can do that to buy a little time to make sure that you really got it. And that person really thinks and believes that you're listening, which you are, but you're also buying time. So introverts have found that to be helpful in interviewing as well as in those um, extemporaneous conversations. I hope that didn't hurt anybody's ear when I snapped there. Can we build um, off that a little bit? We got another question in that talked about, you know, when you're in yeah. that job interview or the application, it asks, uh, you know, how do you work with teams or do you like to work in teams? How do you respond to that as an introvert when that's maybe not? Yeah, you do like to work in teams, right? Michael? It's just how. Exactly. I, I think people mix that up with meetings. Um, and, and I did want to follow up with the meeting. We'll come back to that in a sec, but um, I think that not all the question I would even come back to Michael and say, the meetings that you have, do you really need the meeting? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a thing to question. Do we have to get things done all through meetings? People, that's been the complaint before COVID. After, now the virtual meetings amplify it, but it's very stressful for introverts to constantly be in these settings. So I really push back on the need for meetings. We can get things done through asynchronous synchronous conversations using Slack other tools, we can email, we can, you know, you can have a phone call. I just had a phone call yesterday. It was like a breath of fresh air, like a real phone call. And the introvert was ready for it. They did, I didn't just call them. We made an appointment and it was much more kind of smooth flowing. So I think we have to look at different ways of communicating. So the question here was, um, uh, what was the question coming up soon? The interview coming up soon. A lot of people are afraid of interviewing, but Anna, what was it that related to uh, the, the question again, could you repeat that? So in teams, so if someone, an introvert maybe <clears throat> doesn't enjoy working in teams, how can they relay mm -hmm. that in an interview in a way where it doesn't come across as a negative? I'll, I'll shoot it to Michael. See, what, how would, what would you advise them? <laughs> well, I think the, the, you know, introverts can be very, very effective in teams by how they work in, in facilitating the, the sharing of information and, and moving things forward. Um, and I don't mean to speak for all introverts. For me, it, it works often best when I'm interacting with ones and twos. I mean, right now we're working on a, on a potential project and I'm, I'm connecting with our workforce centers. I'm connecting with our, our, our director of K-12. I'm connecting with, and just facilitating that information and starting to pull that together into a written document 
and then that becomes the sort of the core of what we would have a meeting about. Um, that we can move, we can we can eliminate about five meetings just by doing the you know, thoughtful prep work before the meeting even starts. Yeah. And then you're forcing your extroverts to do the work that they need to do by themselves and not just, you know, extroverts think out loud, right? So they oftentimes will use those meetings as a sounding board, which is, that's another session we should do on the disconnects because you think you, you don't know what to listen to, introvert, right? And they're just, you know, brainstorming aloud. They, somebody said, I'm uh, down, downloading, I download. So that's what they're doing, Michael, in those meetings, right? And they're not necessarily taking the time to really think it through by themselves or maybe in a small group. So kudos to you for changing culture. Absolutely. Uh, another question I wanted to get to, because we, we received quite a few questions about how, do, how, are, how can I be assertive as an introvert? So one said, I work in an area with a lot of extroverts that are heard by our leaders and the introverts are not. I get interrupted by extroverts when I talk and I am not able to finish what I have to say. It makes me feel like I am not a valued member of the team and people mm -hmm. don't care about what I have to say. So as an introvert, how can I ensure that my voice gets heard as well? I'm, I'll make two suggestions uh, real quick. Get educated uh, yourself on introversion. Uh, and as part of that education, it's sharing it with your team because people can't change what they don't know about. So making folks aware of this topic oftentimes will nip it in the butt. You know, I, I've seen it happen countless times. We go, oh, really? That's what's going on here? We need, and they brainstorm together how to get everybody involved once they understand it. But we can't expect people to be mind readers. So we need to speak up, but we need to also, one way to do that, we're seeing a lot of book clubs now. We're seeing uh, the real rise of, um, this is very exciting to me, of um, employee resource groups where I just did something at Amazon where we had like on the first day, they had like 2000 people sign up for this iConnect special group just for introverts. So people wanna learn together and they also wanna create awareness. So they're doing that and that's the seed that they're taking to plant and then getting that out into the larger company. Um, so I think it's really interesting. So I think that's what I would, would suggest as far as, um, as getting the word out on, uh, on introversion and, and sharing that. And I will say one other strategy, because I'm an extrovert and I always keep talking. So I, you'll have to cut me off, Anna, real quick, <laughs> real quick, get, it, get an ally, have an advocate. I've been working in women's studies for a long time and gender inequity. And one of the things we know is very helpful is when you have a man in a meeting who will say, you know, I don't believe, I believe Jennifer's been trying to say something or that, you know, that was an idea I heard Jen say a few minutes ago. If I try to do that, I'm going to be sort of looked at as, you know, in very negative ways, right? Or they might just, again, blow over me. But when I have my friend Fred there speaking up for me, it, it just takes away a lot of the stress and they listen to him. Mm -hmm. So I think allies we're finding in all kinds of gender, kinds of inequity and diversity and inclusion is really important. And every one of us can be an ally to each other. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, I would just add to, to your, your point about allies. And I know that, that as an introvert, networking is often a challenge for me. Um, and when I was first started in leadership, I would, I would be very intentional about networking events. I would come with, here are the people I want to talk to, and here's what I want to talk to them about. And so I would, I would come in and I would, I would corner them and, and just start this earnest conversation. You could just see on their faces that, you know, who is this person and, and how do I extricate myself from this, right? Um, but I, so I've learned to, to be uh, a little more um, subtle in wanting to start those conversations. I still come with that same level of intentionality. But one of the things I found most effective is as I get to know the networks, I identify connectors. And so when I come into a, a, an event, I look for my connectors. And those are the people who love to, to introduce me to other people. And what that, what that does is, is it's, a, it's a great symbiotic relationship, right? They, they get excited because they're connecting me to people who might be able to forward the business of the college. And, and this person, in a sense, does all of the, the work of getting us into a conversation and so that's, so that's kind of my first, as I look for my connectors and, and they help bring me into the meeting. Excellent, I appreciate that. I put a book in there, Give and Take by Adam Grant. If any of you are familiar with Adam Grant's work, it's very, uh, Anna, you're nodding. Yeah, he really talks about how you balance that with the, mm -hmm. and how do you find those connectors? Who are they? So I recommend that one too. 
Absolutely. Yeah, super. And that's certainly super. an area where our extroverted colleagues uh, can- They love it. Compliment. They love it. They get joy from doing that, like Michael was alluding to. <laughs> uh, so another question here. Um, I think this will relate to a lot of folks. How do you balance being an introvert at home? If you have to talk to people all day long at work and then get home and have to talk to your family the remainder mm. of the night, how do you manage that? I'm, I probably should get Bill from upstairs <laughs> and see what he has to say. <laughs> he, uh, I, I'll, I'll just make it a quick aside. In my intro for speeches, he, when I was traveling, I would I'd say, Bill would like to thank you for hiring me. So we got a few days of a break. No, um, I think it's really challenging. I think it really is. Um, extroverts need to. So the question is to is to the introvert or the extrovert in that case. It's the introvert, right? What do they do? I think it's, um, and I should ask Michael, if you live with somebody who's opposite of you, many people do or have family members that way. Um, it's, it's just being transparent about what you need. And it's, again, education around introversion makes a big difference. It did with me early on in my marriage. Uh, it's not always perfect. Uh, sometimes Bill will, will come and say, read the book, you know, um, particularly now in COVID. But um, you have to find um, ways in which you can give that person breaks and you have to speak up about it, that if you don't get that, it's going to be not a pretty picture. So I don't know, Michael, what do you think on that? Well, I really liked Michael's comment in the chat about having uh, using the drive. Uh, I have a long drive to get home and, and that I, I very intentionally create that as my my time to you know, listen to music or to listen to a book on tape or something that will will give me that that ability to to recharge before I go home and, and you know whatever uh, items personal items that have been accumulating during the day and I, I hear them all as I'm coming through the door I'm ready for them uh, but if I didn't have that drive and, and that's been one of the challenges of, of working under the pandemic is there's no drive and so when I leave the room then I have to be ready. And so, so to your point, Jennifer, just having conversations about how can we work well together, my, my partner and I, so that we're, we're able to, um, uh, I, can, I can transition from the work I'm doing and, and having been in, in the presence of people all day to being able to, to talk about things in our personal life. All right. Uh, just a couple minutes left here, so I'll ask uh, one more question, and then uh, both of you can. I, I just want to throw one fact in here that just came out from our report on introverts that I just put in the uh, chat. I think I can give you a link to Anna to put in the sh show notes. You're going to send to folks. We we were blown away. We did a survey for on introverts and remote work. We, within five days, we had 200 responses, and mm -hmm. to Michael's point, we had over 90 percent of respondents said that they were missing that uh, time in the commute. <laughs> so uh, interesting. And no commute too was a positive. People like that too, not commuting. And you're ice and snow up there, right? Right. <laughs> so I know kind of the topic of this was introverted leader. Um, if you had uh, one piece of advice to give to people on the call that maybe feel like they want to advance into a leadership position or feel like they have leadership skills and, the, and the, if those skills aren't noticed by their organization or noticed by their leaders, what advice would you give to those people? Michael, you wanna go, go and then I'll go? Sure. Um, well, I, think, I think for me, I, what was most helpful is to, to really think intentionally about what is leadership and um, you know, if I want to advance, I, I need to think about reframe that leadership isn't just a performance art, right? Because we tend to reward, as, as Jennifer, you've mentioned, reward people for the capacity to stand before people, speak inspirationally, act decisively and confidently. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think, you know, for me, leadership is really about a relationship between those who lead and those who follow. And to be effective, followers have to grant you the legitimacy to lead. And so if you want to be effective beyond just exercising positional power, you really need to build relationships. And that's where I think uh, introverts can be very powerful, very powerful is, is um, you spend, I, so I spend a lot of my time connecting with people across the colleges, celebrating what they do, facilitating the flow of information, pulling people together to advance projects. And this is how you, you're able to, I'm able to build a coalition of shared leadership that helps me be effective. Uh, and I, I think that's something you can do it at any level. And, and, and I, you know, I, kudos to you because you do that, right? You, you take time to connect with us and you're, you will share ideas about how we can advance the Dakota County, County Technical College and, and that that gets noticed, right? And so we, we see in that your potential and you don't have to you know, demonstrate extroverted leadership to be recognized. Thank you, Michael. 
Mm-hmm. Jennifer, any final thoughts on that? I, I, there, I, it's hard to top that. I just, I want to thank Anna, Anna too, and just show that you, in what I said about the quote about leaders show how they lead. And you are, you showed all of the strengths of an introvert in preparing for this and making it happen. We have over 282 people on. Thank you all from the, all the different colleges. I think it's just a, really a matter of building on your quiet strength and being a champion for introverts will unleash everybody's talent that way. And it's been a real privilege today to, uh, to connect with you all across the miles. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Jennifer and Michael, for all of your great insights and advice today and for all that both of you are doing to support introverted, friendly workplaces and introverts. Mm -hmm. For all of our attendees today, you will receive a message when you leave the webinar with a link to a survey to provide feedback on today's session. By filling out this survey, you will be entered into a drawing to to receive a free copy of the Introverted Leader book. The link is posted in the chat as well. You will receive an email next week with a link to the recording for this webinar and additional resources for introverts, some of those that Jennifer mentioned today. Thank you all for attending and have a great rest of your day.